Don't forget this one verification when you design reinforced concrete elements. Whenever you have a beam strip footing or wall that is exposed to a centric load, then you need to verify that element for torsion. Torsion is often neglected, too often if you ask me. Even in our university classes, we often don't have enough time to cover it. Welcome to episode 2 of the Reinforced Concrete series, where we cover everything you need to know about Reinforced Concrete. My name is Laurin, I'm a full-time structural engineer and in the next weeks and months I'll teach you the basics of Reinforced Concrete, such as shear, torsion, bending, compression design. We'll dive deeper into anchorage lengths and methods like the strut and tie method. Later we'll also design elements like reinforced concrete beams, slabs, frames and walls. So if you don't want to miss any of future tutorials then subscribe to the channel. In today's video we'll cover examples where Torsion needs to be verified in reinforced concrete structures and I'll walk you through the six steps to verify reinforced concrete elements such as beams for torsion. Okay, so three examples of torsion in reinforced concrete elements. There are plenty of examples actually where torsion needs to be considered. I picked three cases that I worked with the most um, where torsion had to be checked. So the first example, precast concrete beam supporting one precast slab, which is this beam here. And the precast concrete slabs, they are spanning in this direction and they are simply supported beams like this. And this precast concrete slab is also a simply supported beam. Oops. this. Um, so yeah, the precast concrete slabs are not supported in the center of gravity of the beam um, and therefore they have to transfer vertical loads with an eccentricity, which we can actually see in this picture here. So basically this is the, the center of the precast beam and you can see here the precast concrete beam and it's actually transferring all of its vertical load here. So we have this eccentricity here, which again creates this bending moment here, or like this torsion moment, um, which we calculate with the vertical load times E. The, the torsional moment is taken up by then by compression in the concrete of the top of the beam, the joint and the precast slab. So you need to verify actually the concrete beam, this one here, then the concrete of the joint here, this one, and then also the precast uh, hollow core slab here for this compression stress. And then this torsion moment also creates this tension force down here and that's why we add reinforcement in the bottom of the um, joint or like in this case in the bottom of the precast slab joint and hollow core slab. I'll show you the verification steps for concrete compression and tension of the reinforcement later in this video. Um, let's quickly look at example 2 where torsion can appear in reinforced concrete structures and that is a strip footing with eccentric loading from walls. We often have this case that we have a strip footing and then we have the load bearing wall, which is in this case a reinforced concrete wall. But we also need to put the brick facade in front or like some other type of facade. And often the reinforced concrete wall is not placed in the center of the strip footing, like here, but instead eccentric. And again, this kind of, this, this load here creates a torsion moment in this direction, which we now, um, yeah, can see. And yeah, I also wrote here, due to the insulation reasons, um, a plinth is used to connect the foundation plate and raft with the strip footing. Um, or simply if a column or wall wasn't placed correctly in the execution. You know, imperfections that can also always happen. 
and we should always include some tolerances for this torsion behaviors. Um, statically speaking, these eccentricities are not ideal be because the eccentricity leads to a torsion in the strip and or a bending moment at the top of the strip, which needs to be accounted for in the verification of the soil. What do I mean by this? Yeah, basically we get this bending moment um, down here. Now you need to check. So we get a bending moment. And this bending moment, when we also have a vertical load here, creates this unequal distribution of loads down here for the soil. This is not the topic of this tutorial, um, but you can see that we have a much smaller surface area now where we can actually transfer our forces to the soil. Now, example three, precast concrete floor diaphragm with three walls exposed to horizontal wind loading. Um, the horizontal loads from wind and seismic load and earth pressure travel from the facades to the floor diaphragms. So actually, yeah, we have an area load, which is kind of applied to the whole facade, like this, and then the facade distributes the wind loads or like any kind of horizontal loads to the slabs. Um, like in this case, P horizontal. Um, and then these horizontal loads travel through the slab and to the shear walls. In the following, we look at a floor diaphragm which needs to resist the torsional moment. This floor diaphragm can be simplified with a simply supported beam um, in X direction like this one, simply supported beam. The two shear walls act as support, so they take up these horizontal loads. But now the tricky part is in uh, Y direction, uh, it, it acts more like a cantilever beam. So we have P horizontal and then we kind of have this cantilever beam here uh, with a torsional moment because we only have one wall in that direction. So yeah, we have this horizontal load, we have then the reaction force here and we have this bending moment because we have this cantilever uh, which is kind of like in this direction. Um, so let me show you. So this is the torsional moment. Um, which is calculated as P horizontal times the eccentricity. So, and then basically the two shear walls in X direction take up this torsional moment by, again, the distance between, between them. So you can divide the torsional moment with this distance to get two reaction forces. The torsional moment M torsional leads to shear forces in the diaphragm, as I explained earlier, in Y and X direction, which needs to be verified for. But reinforced, as I said, reinforced concrete slabs have quite a big shear capacity, um, and that's why di those diaphragms are often not verified. But it's getting very critical for precast concrete floors, especially if you have some holes and some openings. Um, once I kind of designed a precast concrete floor, which look kind of like, like this. And then the difficult part, you know, you have wind loads that go in this direction. And of course, they are also pulling here. And wind load is also like on these facades. And here. And the tricky part was also that they never had the same span. And by the way, this was 80 meters. And I think this was 100 meters. So it was quite a big building. And now all these loads that were applied here, they kind of, or like even here, they kind of had to travel through here because we almost didn't have any shear walls in this area here. 
So they kind of all they had to travel through this huge slab all the way here. And I think it took me like three weeks to verify this floor system to add in enough shear capacity and shear, like joint reinforcement. But this is very important. If you didn't understand everything, don't worry. It took me personally a long time to understand diaphragms. And I'm going to publish more videos on that in the future. Um, and there are a lot of different methods. And I just published a newsletter about the four different methods how to verify floor diaphragms. Link will be in the description below. So now let's get into the juicy part. Torsion verification of reinforced concrete in six steps. So in this video, we'll use an example to run through the six steps. So um, we already saw this example, this precast concrete beams that are supporting hollow core slabs. So first step, step one, define the properties of concrete and reinforcement. These are the properties we're going to use. So we're using a concrete C30. Here are the partial factors and we'll use a reinforcement deal strength of 500 megapascal. Now, step two, calculate the ver vertical loads. We'll simplify the step and define the design area load on the pre-test concrete slabs as seven kilonewton per square meter. The design area load is calculated from characteristic loads and load combinations. Um, if you don't know how to calculate design loads, I published a book about that. It goes into depth and it shows you everything you need to know about calculating loads and load combinations. Um, link will be in the description below. So the precast concrete slab spans as a simply supported beam from beam to beam, like this simply supported beam, um, which leads to a reaction force on the beam of 24.5 kN per meter, which we then apply here as a line load on the static system of the precast concrete beam. And if we do a section in this direction, then we can actually see again where the load is applied to the beam and the eccentricity we get from it. Our next step three, calculate the eccentricity and the torsional moment. First, we need to know the location of the centroid. And it's not an article about how to calculate the centroid um, of the cross section, but I'll leave a link to an article that I've written down below. So for cross complex cross sections like this one, I like to use Rhino Grasshopper um, with the area moments component, which is this one. Um, and yeah, it kind of finds the centroid. And then you kind of can measure um, the distance from one of the edges to the centroid. So I found that uh, as 155 plus 140 millimeters. Then as the next step, we'll find the geometrical parameters WA and WJ and WS of this image which are kind of defining the eccentricity. The support width of the concrete slab depends on its height and probably also the country to design the building in. So in Denmark, for example, WS is always taken as uh, 65 millimeters for slabs of a thickness of 220 millimeter. From my experience, then we calculate the eccentricity E as 273 millimeters, which is here. And next we'll calculate with the eccentricity and the vertical load, the torsional moment as 6.7 kilonewton meter. Step four, calculate the pair of forces, compression stress and tension force. The torsional moment is taken up by a pair of forces compression and tension forces. So the compression zone is in the top, like here, of the beam, and a t tension force in the reinforcement anchored to the beam and the precast concrete slab. And this reinforcement has to be anchored here. So you at least need to have an anchorage length, which we also have written an article about and we'll publish a video about it at some point. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to the channel. 
We then decide the length of the compression zone to be 60. You can choose that, but I picked 60 in this case and the rebar is placed 60 millimeters from the bottom of the precast slab. The distance x between the pair of forces is then calculated as 110 and the compression force and tension force is then calculated as 60.9 kN. Step 5. Verify concrete compression. We calculate the compression stress per meter that acts in a compression zone. So we calculate the compression stress as the compression force divided by the compression area. Um, so 60 mm is the, the height of the compression zone and per meter. And this leads us to a compression stress of 1.01 megapascal. Now we compare that with the design compression strength. And this is leading us to a utilization of 5.1%, which is like nothing. And this is smaller than 100%, so this is okay. In step six, we verify the reinforcement. First, let's calculate the tensile strength of the rebar. For a diameter of 16 millimeter, um, we, we get a cross-sectional area of 201 square millimeters, um, and this leads to a tensile capacity of 87.5 kN. And then we can calculate the utilization of the rebar as tensile force T divided by the tensile capacity is 69%, which again is smaller than 100%. And this me means that the rebars are very fine. Now there's only one verification missing. We need to make sure that the reinforcement is anchored correctly. In this lab, we need to make sure that the anchorage length is fulfilled. And because we can't fulfill the anchorage length in the beam here, um, because it's kind of not, because it's not wide enough, so here, uh, we need to add an end plate. And this end plate, which we can see in this picture, is then transferring the tension force T as compression to the concrete in this area here. And of course, you also need to verify that the compression force in the concrete here, or like the compression strength is smaller than the compression resistance of the concrete. Um, we won't show now how to calculate the anchorage length in, in this video, but I'll leave a link in the description below to an article that I've written about it. And I just wanted to make you aware of this because there's a lot of engineers that don't care enough about these small little details and I've seen a lot of verifications and documents where actually the anchorage length was not fulfilled and also the anchorage length and the, the strength calculations were not uh, verified. But the good thing here is you're watching this video and this also means that you care and great engineers care also about these small details. So that's why I mentioned them. Yeah, so this is how we verify reinforced concrete elements for torsion. If you don't want to miss any future episodes, then subscribe to the channel. And also you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter. It's free and the link will be in the description below. And there's also links to all the other free stuff in the description below. I hope you got value, I hope you return and I see you in episode 3. Ciao!